Good evening. Welcome to the September 28th regular meeting of Everett Public Schools Board of Directors. I'd like to announce that we are offering closed caption is being provided by Zoom solely for the convenience of our viewers. Zoom closely closed caption may not always describe accurately due to limitations of the machine generated service. Everett Public Schools does not review for accuracy and makes no representations or warranties regarding the accuracy, reliability, timeliness, or completeness of any information that appears in a closed caption. Will you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. For a point of order, we're going to do the land acknowledgement as first. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot this is our first meeting <laughs> yeah. where we have switched the order. Thank you very much, Director Lassane. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land whose, on whose shoulders we stand. In every public schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you so much. Okay, now we will recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Mason? Present. Vice President Lassane? Present. Director Nichols? Present. Director Mitchell? Present. Director Berg? Present. Student Representative Pilch Besson? Student Representative Colley? I was just going to ask, um, was one of our student representatives going to be zooming in tonight or? Yes. But I don't see them. Okay, so they will join when, okay, thank you. Uh, item 5.0, adoption of the agenda. Dr. Salzman, may you please provide an overview of tonight's agenda? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and the public. Good evening. The superintendent's report. Tonight's agenda will begin with the superintendent's report. A segment for board comments. Segment for public comments. Segment for routine business. Segment for information and discussion and upcoming agenda items. Since publishing the agenda, the following change was made to the agenda. Item 5.01, adoption of the agenda. The timing sheet was updated. Item 10.02, approval of the personnel report. The personal report was updated. Item 12.01, back to school update. The presentation was updated. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we will move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The agenda is adopted. That takes us to recognitions, and tonight we do not have any recognitions, so we will move on and uh, ask Dr. Salzman for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public. Good evening. I'd like to start off by saying that the start of school continues to go well, and everything is back in full swing. As you see the students in the buildings, and I compliment the student body for wearing their masks and the teachers for doing an amazing job. It's just nice to have that energy to see youngsters. Gosh, are we looking forward to our Learning Improvement Day on October 15th? All schools and departments will be participating, and the focus in our district is on equity, including cultural competency, <coughs> diversity, and inclusion. And I'm excited for that day. Staff will be part of this Learning Day, and it's going to be just a wonderful day. And last year, we had a wonderful experience with over a thousand participants and we're looking forward to more this year. I would like to just say tonight that four outstanding Everett Public School seniors have been named as National Merit Scholarship semifinalists at Henry N. Jackson High School, Ryan Cho, Alan Fu, Karan Hubbard, 
and Everett High School, Audrey Weir. Semifinals represent less than 1% of U.S. high school seniors who achieved the highest scores on the 2020 PSAT. Finalists will be named February 1st, and about 7,500 of those will go on to receive scholarships that together $30 million will be awarded scholarships across our nation. So salutes to those hardworking students. And again, to thank the board and the public for all their support as we've reopened school this year live with youngsters. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that report. We'll go ahead and move forward to item 8.0, which is board comments. And I will go ahead and just take a volunteer if someone has something they'd like to Sure. So today I had the opportunity to visit uh, Whittier uh, Elementary School for their instructional interview. Um, it was a great um, opportunity for me. This is the first one I've done as a director. So uh, I was pretty excited to be there. Um, saw a lot of great teachers, saw a lot of great learning happening. Um, so that was, that was really nice to see. Um, nice to see kids back in the classroom, happy to be there, that type of stuff. So. That's all I have for comments. Thank you. Um, so I don't have very much, but I just wanted to say, um, I guess another thank you to staff and especially the folks who are doing um, contact tracing. And I just am saying this as a parent because I know it's really hard out there. I know it's really frustrating. Um, but thank you for maintaining these amazing seating charts. Thank you for being diligent. And thank you that we haven't had disruption, disruption of learning um, at a whole, at a, as a district-wide level because we've had such diligent and amazing staff. Um, and I guess the only other thing I want to say is that we're, we're closing out. This is our last meeting during um, Mental Health Awareness Month. And I was just sharing with one of my directors, just um, I got to go out to the movies with my girls this weekend and saw um, what I think is a pretty good um, show about mental health. And so if you haven't seen it, Dear Evan Hansen is out in theaters. And if you want to see something about mental health from a teenager's perspective, from a family's perspective, it's incredibly, incredibly moving and sad, but I think that it's um, it can really be the foundation for important conversations around folks that you love, young people and, and folks who are older. So I just want to say that my heart goes out to all the families um, who are struggling this month. And um, yeah, there's always going to be a better day. So thanks. Thank you. Director Mitchell. Yeah, thank you. Um, mine is actually, a, I appreciate both those comments, but um, uh, we had the benefit of going to family weekend. And one thing I want to say, um, as a young teenage girl at 5'10", everybody always asked me, are you a basketball player? And I would have to say no, because I have no eye-hand coordination. But we did say La see Lafayette play UPenn. And I want to say this to all athletes out there. If you are not 5'10 or taller, does not mean you cannot play for University of Pennsylvania because they had an outstanding player who was only five foot five. And um, I just was really impressed with that, that I think that any athlete out there, all of our athletes, and if somebody says you're too short, seriously, UPenn had an outstanding player who was five foot five. Lafayette did win, but it was only Penn's first loss. So just want to, um, just give give good thoughts out there to all of our athletes. Thank you, Director of the Same. Okay, thank you. I I just wanted to um, comment a little bit um, in continuation of Director Berg's comment. Um, the CDC this week came out with um, a couple studies regarding the effectiveness of masking in school and um, comparing districts that don't require it or states that don't require it and how it does indeed work and it's working really well and it's a it's what's allowing us to keep our kids in the classroom um and with that said i think we all understand that masking isn't that great you know we'd all rather not not have to do this but um i do appreciate the vigilance of our state and our district to continue to do that so that we can continue to bring kids into the classroom at this time so Okay, without student representatives, we'll go ahead and move forward. Our next item of business oh, is. We have, uh, Bint is here. Pardon? Bint, our student representative. Oh, is she, is she is on? She... Yeah, I'm on. Hello. Hi. 
<laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hi, sorry I couldn't be there in person yeah, today. Sorry you couldn't join us this evening, but glad that you were able to make it and use that technology to our advantage. Did you have um, some comments for us this evening? Um, well, this week at school has been really good. We've been focused on homecoming mostly, and we've started a lot of our homecoming planning. A lot of people have been upset that we can't have a dance, but fortunately we can still do all the fun stuff during the week. We have a tailgate game on Friday and we've had a spirit week all this week, which have been going really good. Um, so yeah, things have been good at school, getting back to normal um, with classes. The teachers, I think it's been really good how the teachers have slowed down. Me and Tara talked about this as well on Zoom yesterday. Um, we feel that the teachers have slowed down a lot over like the, like since we came back from COVID, things have slowed down and it's been a lot easier to like understand in classes because teachers haven't been moving so fast and giving us a little more room to be confused just because we had the whole year off and we hadn't had any time to learn anything. So I think things have been going really well and it's slowly getting back to normal, which I'm very happy about. Right. I love that comment that teachers are giving us time to be confused. That's just a beautiful thing about learning. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you feel better. Thank you so much. Okay, now we will go ahead and move on to our public comment section. And tonight we do have two audience comments. Our first speaker tonight is Joe Bon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you are a substitute of the district uh, and yeah. um, I'm going to let you know how this works. You're mm -hmm. already at the lectern. You do not need to adjust the microphone. It's very sensitive. Um, there are three lights on the podium there. Um, the first one it will turn green and that <coughs> signifies the beginning of your three minutes. The yellow will give you a 30 second warning and the red is the expiration of your time. And we appreciate you being here to share your comments with the board. And this is a time for us to listen and not discuss. So uh, please, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Let's see if we can squeeze it all in that moment. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mason. Honored uh, board members, I wanted to thank the Everett School Board for the opportunity to bring this to attention and adjust it to their sus substitute teachers and possibly other uh, Everett Public School employees. The HR department informed me on September 18th that the benefits office has reviewed my assignment and determined that you will not be eligible for SEB benefits for the 2021 and 22 school year unless you experience qualifying change. This all stems off of the SEB's interpretation of Senate Bill 6189 that refers to the benefits being maintained into the 2020-21 school year for employees who had el eligibility for the employer contribution towards SEB benefits as of February 29th, 2020. Please understand that the school district and the HR department I know are not responsible for this situation. But I'm hoping that this board and the head of Everett's HR department will respond to the legislature, our state employee representatives, and the SEB in support of their affected employees. The bit of information uh, from the state of Washington Healthcare Authority um, regarding, uh, uh, it's a long uh, SR, um, the law employees uh, it, it has a benefit, uh, sorry, school employees who gain in benefits to employees' contribution to the SEB benefits as of March 2020 or later are not protected by the, S by the SB 6189, sorry. Uh, these uh, employees are subject to standard SEB uh, eligibility rules. These standard SEB LG rules say that benefits are offered to employees with 630 hours plus of work during a school year and who have taken a long-term position. During the COVID, the opportunity to achieve the 630 hours goal was cut short due to the sudden change to remote learning uh, as of March, eliminating the need for almost every substitute. This carried over into the next school year through April of 22, or sorry, 21 when the change of the hybrid learning environment became the standard. Still, most substitutes did not find employment during that time. The substitutes with health care because they qualified previously are now being removed by the health care uh, by SEB because they did not fulfill the standard eligibility. 
requirements for, for that normal year. Because COVID and the remote learning in 2019 and 19 and 20, um, there have not been normal years, and we have not had the opportunity to serve as a substitutes. And even though I've been a substitute, uh, loyal substitute teacher with the Everett School District since 20, or 2003, pretty much as a full-time teacher with at least double those hours required, I lose my health care coverage because of this law and the interpretation by SEBB. Even though they took long-term positions in early 2020, and you know, through the close of the, um, uh, at the also the uh, beginning of 2021, when we were able to get back in April, I fall short of those needs for those two years. Because of also the, uh, I can't get the, um, because they've also interpreted that they are not going to give us the standard 330 hour, or 630 hours for this year, they're dropping all of us who have uh, coverage. I asked the school board to direct the school district to lodge a formal protest with the SEBB on behalf of their substitutes and substitutes all across the Washington state at their earliest opportunity. We need to, we will be removed from our insurance plans October 31st. So quick action is being required. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. We appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, pardon my, my attire. I was teaching uh, PE today at elementary. <laughs> if that doesn't show you my loyalty. <laughs> Thank you. We have a second speaker tonight. We have one public speaker that is online tonight. Jared, will you please promote Melia Holloway to panelists so they can join us via Zoom? Okay, Miss Holloway, are you there? Hi, I am here. Hi there. Oh, let me clean my phone real quick. Sorry about that. Hi. How are you guys tonight? Very good. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and uh, we'll start the beginning of your three minutes. Fantastic. Um, I would like to begin now. Um, I wanted to share with the board and other members what I've been experiencing. Um, I've had quite the experience with the Everett School District since I arrived here about two years ago with my daughter. Um, she's disabled, um, she's legally blind, and she is. Well, she would have graduated last year had the things happened that have transpired with our time um, in the Everett School District. So when we came here, she was <clears throat> undereducated because of the prior school we had been at. She came here in hopes that we were gonna get the services she needed as far as getting taught Braille, um, traveling skills and things like that. <clears throat> We've been here now two years. <clears throat> she gained one credit last year. She gained two credits the year before that. Um, at the Everett District, she has not been taught Braille <clears throat> extensively or even to maintain it for an adult life or traveling skills to be able to navigate outside by herself. Um, this has been now two years going and now she didn't get to graduate last year. She's going to be going into this year, but she hasn't even started this, year, this school year yet because they're not prepared for her. Um, they don't have two, they don't have instructors for her to be able to learn. Um, she's literally put into two classes and that's it. Um, this is really concerning for me because she is 18 now and she should be very well uh, available to be able to go out into public, get around, get her needs met, have friends, be able to access materials and other, <clears throat> other things that she needs for employment but she is not able to do these things. Um, it's a concern for me and, and I would hope for everybody on the board that <clears throat> this is happening. And it's not probably just my daughter, <clears throat> sorry. It's probably many more. Um, I've gone to now a due process with um, the school and I have now, I'm now being sued by the school um, because of my due process and my wish to get my daughter's needs met. Um, and it's really unfortunate. This is the route that things are going when she just needs help and that's all I'm trying to get. Um, so being sued now by by the school district is is really unfortunate when they're still not willing to help my daughter get what she needs as a visually impaired student um, and, and an education, um, which she rightfully should have. So I just wanted to share with everybody today that this is happening because I'm not sure if you guys know or not or what you've heard or if you haven't heard. Um, I just wanted to share with you where, where I'm at and that this is going on. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Okay, those are the only public speakers this evening. 
So we will go ahead and move forward with the consent agenda and I'd ask Dr. Salzman to provide an overview, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors and the public. The board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items such as meeting minutes, personnel actions, expense vouchers, surplus lists, gifts, grants, and recurring contracts. Sometimes it includes items that occur less frequently but are of a routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the Friday report one or more weeks before the board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda item in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received no questions regarding items on the consent agenda. The consent agenda is presented as published for board approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So oh, move. Oh, second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Would any director like to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in new business section of the agenda? Hearing no such requests, we will go ahead and move to the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Consent agenda is approved, which takes us to strategic progress monitoring. And tonight we do not have a strategic progress monitor monitoring item. So we will go ahead and move to our information and discussion section. And the first item, 12.01, is a back to school update. And I believe we have quite a few presenters, um, starting with Dr. Scott. We do, thank you very much. I'm gonna pull this up and Share my screen. <clears throat> okay, I think that worked. Good evening, President Mason, Board of Directors, and Dr. Salzman. It's our privilege tonight to update you with a back to school highlight, the review of the first weeks of school in the 21-22 school year. Uh, this information we're going to present tonight is sort of a sequel to the information we shared at our last board meeting on September 14th. Tonight we're excited to pick up where we left off um, in terms of highlighting key segments of our back to school preparation and investments to ensure a smooth and successful launch of the school year. Uh, our lineup includes uh, how we align the strategic plan and our staff professional learning on September 1 and 2 for our learning improvement days, building this on-ramp to school um, on the foundation of social emotional learning, health and safety updates, an overview of fall assessment of student learning, technology deployment highlights, enrollment status, and a recent community feedback um, from the September 20th, Let's Connect and a summary of the findings and next steps from that event. So we're really excited to share with you tonight and I'm going to uh, introduce first up Dr. Lancaster. So important to the start of any school year is making sure that the staff are well trained and prepared. So we do that at, through our learning improvement days. And we were very excited this year to be able to frame that around our strategic plan uh, so that we were starting strong and everyone was moving in the same direction as you see here on um, the strategic plan being hung up in the Hawthorne office. Uh, every school engaged in activities around the strategic plan to make sure that all staff were aware of the outcomes, that they understood the intent, and that there was clear alignment. And what I like to think about is we really work to get everyone moving in the same direction with that. Um, additionally, in addition to our strategic plan, we also carried on some themes that we covered at the Leadership Institute, but a strong theme of equity and all staff worked in that area. And you heard earlier from Dr. Salzman that that work continues on October 10th, or 15th, excuse me. Uh, we worked hard on social emotional learning and making sure that those first five days were packed or I would say first five days and beyond because it doesn't stop um, with the work that we did on social emotional learning to help students come back into the school um, center gracefully. 
Uh, additionally, we worked, we worked on family and community engagement. We made some great plans in the spring on what we're going to do with families um, now that we're back full time and then realized that we had to modify that um, with some greater social distancing measures again. We focused on our instructional priorities and implementing our uh, new adoptions um, with, uh, well. And uh, additionally, we uh, talked about logistics because it had been some time since we'd had so many students in school and making sure everybody was fresh on uh, those logistical elements. Um, through all of that, the strands of relationships, teamwork and clarity were important. Uh, just again, how we keep people focused and moving in the same direction. And that was important um, because we know that the, the staff have to be prepared, all of them, the lunchroom, bus drivers, paraeducators, teachers, administrators, everyone needs to be prepared so that students can feel safe uh, and in the classroom so that they can focus on the learning. There's a lot of um, elements that go into that beforehand. And I really liked uh, this quote from the Dalai Lama, when educating the minds of our youth, we must not forget to educate their hearts. So we really tried to take that into account in the school launch. And so uh, I think the next up, you're gonna hear more about the social emotional learning. All right. <clears throat> well, as we returned back to school, we wanted to uh, first express our appreciation for D Dr. Saltzman and his emphasis on uh, social emotional learning especially during the uh, the first several days of, of school and which was really a theme for us all summer long as we prepared for that um, and uh, and really supporting the two of the four pillars there are culture and our climate you know culture being what we do and climate is really around how everybody feels and those two are very uh, tightly related um, and so we put our, our best thinking to work and um, we focused um, our training for our administrators to then bring to their leadership teams uh, to plan their lid days and then obviously uh, with their teaching staff to open up school. Um, we used several um, resources including CASEL, which is the uh, collaborative for academic, um, social and emotional learning. Um, really a, a thought leader and a field building um, advocate for social emotional research practice and policy. Um, IIRP, which is the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and, um, and Rebound, um, which was uh, by Fisher, Fry, and Hattie, um, a playbook for rebuilding agency, accelerating learning, and rethinking schools. And um, as we plan to return and reopen, um, we also leverage this as an opportunity really to, to reimagine. Um, and then maybe to redefine and reinvent um, what the next normal would look like for schooling. And um, so again, um, Dr. Saltzman's emphasis for the uh, social and emotional learning um, it was also important for us to really identify what these first five days were not. Um, and really what it, we, we didn't want it to be uh, social and emotional learning for the first five days and then that's it for the, you know, we got that done. And now let's move on to academics for the rest of the year. It'd be like if we're trying to eat more healthy, we um, maybe wouldn't eat 150 pounds of salad in five days and call it good for the rest of the year, right? We need to spread it out over time. And that's really what this is, was a foundation for the, uh, for the, for the entire year. And so we focused on five key areas. One was relationships um, from adults to students, um, students to students, and then obviously adults and adults. Uh, routines, uh, not just classroom routines, but also those academic routines and utilizing that early time to establish some of those as we worked into the curriculum. Um, student agency, really an opportunity to increase student choice and student voice. Um, high expectations, not just for our kids, but also perhaps for ourselves as we need to really truly believe that students can achieve as they have in the past and that they will uh, again with um, excellent instruction and appropriate supports and also um, <laughs> focusing on building community. We know from our panorama data that um, increasing that sense of belonging is so important, um, a real strong focus for us and we can do that through um, another emphasis on inclusion, um, equity and access and uh, we can use restorative practices too um, to repair the relationships and, and build that community too when things may not uh, just go so smoothly. But um, we um, you have an opportunity at this point as well to hear from two of our teachers 
and um, how they have established uh, social emotional learning on those first five days. And so I am uh, pleased to first present uh, Julie Full. She is a third grade teacher from Mill Creek Elementary, and she will be followed by Kaylee Soros, who's an eighth grade ELA teacher at Evergreen Middle School and a 2013 graduate of Cascade High School. So Julie, come on up. Well, it's such a pleasure um, to be here. So thank you for um, allowing me to speak. Um, I got really excited about the topic of social emotional learning and being able to share um, the work we did these first few days back, which has been absolutely incredible to be with students in person. And I have more pictures than I can talk about. So I will just highlight a few. But on the right um, is an activity we did the very first day of school. Um, I, I teach third grade and at Mill Creek Elementary. And I um, read the story, Our Class is a Family, aloud. And we really emphasized what families look like, that they come in all shapes and sizes, and how a classroom is like a family where every member is important and valued and um, belongs. And to highlight that, I gave them a puzzle piece that was blank, and they put their name on it and decorated it however they wanted. And then the students worked together to put the puzzle together. And the highlight of this activity was, I couldn't have planned it better, was um, I hear a student blurt out, we can't finish the puzzle because there's a piece missing. And we quickly realized that Lucas had been absent on the day we finished this activity and his puzzle piece wasn't done. So it ended up just being a priceless moment of them really understanding that we needed every single one of our 23 kiddos there to um, work together and have an awesome year. So he came the next day and we finished our puzzle. So the next slide. Okay. Me? Here? There we go. <laughs> um, there, here's several activities I did the first um, few days of school as well, but I'll highlight the one on the left, the interactive, inter interactive journals. Um, this is a strategy I've used uh, for the last few years, and I find it one of the most powerful um, uh, relationship building um, activities. And I give the students a new notebook that looks they look different every year, but something like this. And they decorate it and kind of make it their own. And we talk about this being a really safe place for them to um, share anything that's on their mind with me. And they know that I'll read it that day if they put it in this bin. And then I'll respond by the next morning. I learned, um, can't always do it the same day. But I love this because it gives them an authentic reason to write. It also um, allows them to share what's on their heart and their mind. If I have a day where we're busy and we're not having one-on-one -on -one conversations with every student in the classroom, they're able to share what um, they're going through. And sometimes it's, I love chocolate chip pancakes, and sometimes it's, I'm sad my best friend just moved away. And so um, it's a chance for me to write back and just kind of um, meet the students where they're at. So it's been a really um, positive um, relationship building tool. And the other one that I'll share really quickly before my time is up is the kindness shout outs. Um, we really emphasize at Mill Creek Elementary, one of our four expectations in our Cougar Pride system is to be kind. And I really emphasize that a lot in our classroom. And so so this is an activity where the students are trying to find examples of kind words, kind actions throughout the day, and they will jot them down on those circles and put them in the bucket. And then on Fridays, we'll read those out and just thank each other for being kind humans and trying to emphasize kind of that building community sense. So um, I really wanted to thank the district for the emphasis on social emotional needs because it's definitely what our students needed, and it really started a great foundation for a fabulous year. So I will pass it off to you. Kaylee. Hey, so I'm Kaylee Soros. I'm an eighth grade English teacher at Evergreen. And similarly to what was just said, thank you so much for making it an emphasis to focus on SEL. We felt it as a staff, the kids felt it, and it's carrying into these weeks afterwards. Um, in my classes, we also created kind of a one pager and each kiddo, um, we, I gave them kind of a prompt for each section of the pie. And so they had put their names and pronouns and a symbol that represented them and then favorite foods and shows and movies and books and all the things. And then after they finished and before I hung them up, we um, had time for them to walk around and they could look at each piece of their pie and match up where they saw similarities on somebody else's pie. And then they could create and find that connection with someone that wasn't just at their table, but was anywhere um, within the room. And that just kind of, started out our whole year with showing them that look we're talking with each other we're not behind our screens like we get to have the art supplies out and do all of these things and it just 
it felt so good to hear them talking and laughing and hear the colored pencils like clinking everywhere, which normally I'm like, oh my gosh, it's driving me crazy. But it was so amazing to have that happening. Um, and then just to see them excited to find similarities and, oh, I watched that show this summer and all the things like starting that collaborative um, community was exactly what we needed. Um, and then another thing that we did, and I've done this for the past couple of years, um, is creating our class norms. But I really put an emphasis on the fact that it is their class as well, that it's not just me giving them rules that they need to create the expectations that they have for not only each other, but for themselves as well. So um, each of my different blocks chooses a class theme and they each of the tables brainstorms different theme words and then we have a vote on which one they think is the best. So for the example on the screen, um, acceptance was the word that they chose. And then based off of that word, um, it becomes a, our class acronym and each table takes a letter or two from our class theme word and they create the norms based from that. Um, and again, then we go through when we vote and we decide, can we, can we hold ourselves accountable to each of these things and do we need to edit them? And it really lets them feel ownership in the classroom. And I think from years past and even just this year already, like they will point up to it and be like, oh wait, wait, I'm not doing this or we need to remember this. So letting them have the ownership from the get-go just creates um, a culture within the room where I can expect rigorous things of them because they know that they have that ownership. Um, and again, I would like to say thank you so much for having that focus because it has made all the difference and we're continuing to feel it. So thank you so much and thank you for having me. All right, this is a, a natural segue to transition from social emotional learning into our um, health and safety uh, part of the uh, presentation because as we know um, it, it, safety emotional safety is um, just as important as physical safety we obviously that's our highest priority is make sure that kids are safe and staff are safe but also it, we all know it's so important to feel safe as well and that um, that those of us who are entrusted in um, in those areas of responsibility that we take that very seriously and that we do all that we can um, to make sure that 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 is the case and so uh, we have all summer long, uh, as everyone's aware, the, the guidance was continually changing um, and it's still almost weekly, right? We, there's, there's new pieces that um, decisions that are made and, and different um, outcomes from, um, the, from the COVID in the, in the uh, environment here. And, and so we have um, used that consistently in all of our planning and all of our procedures, focusing on um, our guidance from the Department of Health, uh, Department of Labor and Industries, um, and OSPI, um, so that throughout the pandemic, we've been keeping abreast and, uh, and we've been really working hard with what we learned from last year too, to create documents that are living documents that when we post them online, our links, anytime anyone clicks on those, um, it's always, it takes them to the most current guidance. Um, and so we've um, had a lot of opportunities to eliminate some of the, um, you know, redundancies or broken links, we now um, are, are, are able to do a really good job, I think, of um, keeping things very current. We spent um, very intentional time with our training and uh, with our staff. Um, we've updated our family and our COVID uh, staff COVID handbooks several times. Um, in fact, even as recently as today. And uh, again, those are always live and active. And uh, we put together some training videos from our staff we were able to upload those to our safe schools, which is um, which now Vector, uh, but that's um, as part of the staff training to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to to hear the common um, common best practices and guidance. Um, we our, our website uh, has a very um, growing and extensive set of frequently asked questions uh, that. Um, as we get those questions uh, repeated over time, that allows, that informs us that those are uh, pieces of information that folks are really interested in. And so we make sure to maintain that. And, um, you know, what we've learned, I think, from, from last spring, even more than last spring, is the importance to be flexible, <laughs> to, um, to be able to adapt, quickly pivot um, as things change, or, you know, we put our very best planning to have to, as success as the outcome. And then when things play out, there's some kinks and glitches that, you know, um, it just requires some, um, some adjustments. And we do that clearly. 
uh, or quickly, and, uh, but also that we provide communication throughout that whole process, communication that's timely, that's clear, and, and frequent, um, both for our students, our staff, and our families. And um, so and not only were we allowed to come back to the classrooms, but there have also been extend, expanded opportunities for uh, students to return in at athletics. And uh, they have risk protocol levels that are specific to each sport. Um, we have extracurricular and, uh, and family events that are available now. We still provide remote um, options as well, trying to learn, take from the best that we learned last year. But, um, but also to be able to bring folks back to our uh, schools in person, which I think is very, very important. Um, and um, we maintain social distancing and masking um, throughout that process. Um, and um, so finally, we want to say thank you to our community. Um, we are very grateful to them uh, for a number of reasons. And, and um, these have uh, been mentioned or touched on tonight already. But uh, the idea that um, the masking is um, something that is an inconvenience and it's um, you know something that probably many of us would prefer to be able to have the facial expressions and see the the smiles and, and those things but we know that this is what is allowing us to be able to come back right now and we are incredibly grateful for that and we're grateful to our community for um, for sticking with us uh, with that and helping us through that we're also grateful for that they've extended grace to us. Um, again, you know, we, we plan for the very best, and uh, but we things don't always go exactly as we hope, and so and we make adjustments, and we know the contact tracing and quarantining is difficult for a lot of folks too, um, and um, but we just are so appreciative of the grace that they're extending to us. And then finally, for the trust that they've given us. It's um, coming back from a pandemic that's not resolved. There's still a lot of unknowns, and yet people are sending their kids to school because they're trusting that we are going to take care of them and do everything we can to help them be successful while they're with us in Everett Public Schools. So, thank you. So we are currently nearing the end of the window for the diagnostic assessments that were required by the elementary and secondary emergency relief June 1 plan. These are not the accountability tests such as the um, spring smarter balanced and Washington comprehensive assessment of science will be. Rather, these are intended to help teachers and principals to understand where the students sitting in our classrooms right now are in terms of their learning so that teachers and principals can plan for instruction and for the support that they need moving forward. At kindergarten, teachers are administering the Washington Kindergarten Inventory of Developing Skills, or the WAKIDS, you're probably familiar with that um, term. In grades one through five, students are taking the iReady Diagnostic in Reading and in Math. And in grades 6 through 12, students are taking the Performance Matters Comprehensive Assessments, which are based on the student's grade level in the 2021 school year. When the window closes, teachers and principals will begin analyzing the assessment to inform instruction and support. And I say begin because these assessments are comprehensive diagnostics, so there's a lot of data involved. And really, the intention is to understand students' learning and the support that they might need. So. The question is, what am I going to teach Ness, and what part of this test will help to inform me about where my students are and what additional help they might need to access this new learning? So I'd like to, to cover a few technology highlights that uh, for our back to school update. Um, for to begin with, our priority was to make sure all the students had computers. And so we worked with uh, the buildings. Each principal had a different plan uh, of when they wanted to do this and how they wanted to do this. And so our department uh, worked closely with the principals on how they carried out that plan uh, to ensure that they had that. Some did it as part of orientation. Some did it in those first days of school. We spent some time swapping out devices, especially those that had them over the summer of ones that maybe were not working that needed some swap out. So that was really a focus initially for us at the beginning of the year. Uh, and then as we, we came back to instruction and we're back into instruction and, and teaching through masking, the idea of audio enhancement is a, is a priority as well. And so over the summer, we worked on the first phase of an audio enhancement in six of our elementaries that have Juno systems installed 
And those are at Emerson, Garfield, Hawthorne, Jackson, Lowell, and Madison. And those are audio enhancement systems that those teachers had for day one. And we also have the option of teachers having a portable uh, speaker that they can have us that, that allows them to project in the classroom. That's kind of a more portable unit. So we gave teachers a couple of different options there of teaching through masking, which is a, a new a new reality for us. Uh, customer service continues to be a priority, and I've shared this updates with the board over time about what that looks like, about how we support our students, staff, and parents with our help desk. They can still continue to call uh, or submit a help desk ticket for uh, to get support in whatever they might need support with uh, related to technology. We do have two options for internet access at home. I, I've shared we'll continue to partner with T-Mobile for the portable hotspot, but this year we're also uh, offering broadband, uh, partnering with Comcast to uh, have broadband installed in, in families, uh, qualifying families for their program uh, to have broadband rather than relying on hotspots. And we've had several uh, families opt for that rather than the hotspot route. And they can do that, those requests through our help desk ticket. But as we return to live instruction, we return to blended learning rather than remote learning, which was really the computer was the focus. And in blended learning, which is we've talked about in the past, the, we're going back to that where it's a blend of, of online media with one to, with live instruction. And so my department will spend the focus at the initial of, at the start and throughout the year is helping te supporting teachers in returning back to that blended learning approach and the tools and support that they'll need. Well, one of the lessons we learned, um, a lot of the lessons we learned during remote learning, we, we continue on and one is the a key one is the parent communication and engagement and um, the use of canvas gradebook online enrollment remind those are all tools we really uh, developed in earnest during remote learning and we carry those forward and one exciting addition is the less talk feature in chatbot chat because they can get support uh, at any time during the day but it's also how they can submit a help desk ticket that they can easily on our website navigate how to get a request into our help desk to get them the support that they need. And lastly, I just would like to, I'd like to say that everything I've shared with you today is a result of the 2016 capital levy that our voters and our community supported. And we are so grateful for that. And as we, as we consider future levy uh, op opportunities, the continuation of this and, and the support of our community is something we look forward to, but really grateful for that 2016 levy and hopeful uh, continued support in the future. Thank you. Good evening. Um, if you recall last spring, we had conversations about how do we project what the enrollment will be for this current school year. And I think after consulting other districts, uh, most of us thought we would recover about half of our students. As you can see from the numbers, which are projected to October 1st, so they are a projection from day eight, but we'll know more in about two days. Um, we did end up about the same as we did last year. We have 26 less students. Um, however, below budget, we are 395. In anticipation, as we did last year, we also held on seven elementary positions. Um, we held them vacant because as our, 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 our school leaders are talking to the community, they have, a, they have a sense of where enrollment will be for their schools. And if you were to ask, <clears throat> where did the enrollment not show up? It was a little more in first grade than kindergarten, but those two, I think we thought we'd get some recovery that didn't occur, but it's really across the system. Um, we did have higher than expected. Oh, and the, and, and the, and the bright spot is we always um, look for the opportunities to eliminate split classes or a two, three grade. So we have the fewest in many years, less than a handful um, on highly capable and in regular ed. Um, we do have higher than expected enrollment in Everett Virtual Academy. Um, those families made a choice and so as a result we have result we have shifted some educators uh, from a, a classroom setting to a virtual setting it has evolved since this slide was made and it's down to about nine educators but we've rebalanced and things are in place to move forward and to finish up tonight's presentation i'll conclude with our let's connect event um, on Monday, September 20th, was our first Let's Connect event this school year, where district staff engaged with 247 community members on Zoom to collect their feedback and perspectives 
about our launch to the school year. In addition to breakout rooms conducted in English, Dr. Kathy Woods hosted a Let's Connect Zoom uh, that evening in Spanish, uh, serving 26 participants. The questions we posed to our community for their feedback that evening were, how, what went well to start the school year? What areas could we still improve upon? And are there any extra supports your child needs to make this school year successful? The notes taken during the Let's Connect event have been synthesized into major themes and have been posted on our district website under the Our District tab in the engagement section for our community's review. In summary, the feedback we received from the community about what has gone well to start the year included our district communications to families about the launch of the year and communication from schools about the school's events leading up to the first days of school or a success. Families appreciated our focus on social emotional learning the first five days of school and that we are continuing to that focus as the school year progresses along. And uh, our families are also were also complimentary about our providing a K-8 online learning option this year through the Everett Virtual Academy. Community feedback about how we can continue to improve and support their students' future success included proactive communication about the quarantining process for students who are required to quarantine and the learning supports available to them while they are at home. Continued focus on teaching students the importance of social distancing at school, particularly in the larger common spaces. And finally, feedback about some school bus transportation routes running late and being crowded and congestion at some schools parking lots causing delays during student pickup by parent drivers. In response to our community's feedback, our next steps as a district include hiring more bus drivers, which will allow us to add more bus routes and reduce overcrowding on some of our buses, uh, conducting parking lot pickup and drop off analysis at some schools with our transportation and facilities staff to address the over the congestion, continuing our emphasis on social distancing and social emo emotional learning for students uh, with school staff, reminding parents how to select their preferred method of communication from school and district uh, communication sources so they will not receive duplicate messages um, unless they choose to do so. And then co uh, communicate proactively with families the supports available to their, uh, at their school to their student to remain engaged while learning when required to quarantine. And this concludes our back to school update. Um, we are ready for your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, all the presenters. Um, I have to say this is just a tremendously wonderful presentation. Um, I personally want to thank everyone in this room for the outstanding job of launching the district off to a school year so successfully in such an unusual environment. I mean, you folks really did such an amazing job. <laughs> and this presentation basically encapsulates everything that did happen and every slide i'm like oh this is great oh this is great so um i just want to say thank you i don't have questions because you guys covered it quite well <laughs> um i am going to turn it over to other directors though if you have questions or you want to share anything director lasane yes i do also want to say thank you very much for bringing this presentation to us because uh and to the community because it you have really worked very hard in bringing us back to online or not online but in person learning i mean it's just a wonderful thing and and i know kids learn better in that that you know environment i had one question it's regarding our enrollment status and um my question is we have higher than expected enrollment in everett virtual academy can you shift um shift the information to give me a number of how many students are included in that K through eight. I mean, have you put those numbers in the numbers that are listed here of students, or can you let me know how many students are enrolled in, in Everett Virtual Academy? So currently we have 687 students enrolled in Everett Virtual Academy. Now, does that also include Port Gardner and online learning, or is it separate from those? 
too. It's a separate program. So we have students enrolled in online high school. Those students are enrolled in our comprehensive high schools. That's where you see their enrollment. And then they take classes through online high school. And Port Gardner has its own enrollment as well. Okay. And I don't have those numbers at the top of my head. So those 687 in Everett Virtual Academy, they make up elementary and middle school students. Yes, they those do. numbers are they listed in this graphic right here on that page? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Is that all you had? That's it. Thank okay. you. I, have, I want to just say if that's all right. Um, thank you to both of the teachers. Um, what a great way to elevate eighth graders by giving them that deciding on the theme and voting on all those words. Thank you for that. And then for your um, your interactive journal, um, just what a great way for the kids to communicate, like you said, in that 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 private way, chocolate chip pancakes, but you know, you probably also do learn some safety things. And just for that, for kids who aren't gonna speak up, I just really, really appreciate that. And the fact too, that I heard you say you give them, um, you know, I hope that that is something that, that we support but just the fact it's not one more thing kids have to provide. So thank you for that. Um, and I do tell for uh, what what Director Berg said earlier and what you provided Dr. Mason about the, the CDC and about safety. Um, I really appreciated safety being in a lot of the slides because we are responsible to educate in a safe environment. So I really, um, safety is is utmost importance right now with all of the masks and everything to keep them safe but i appreciate that um a question and, and direct uh, uh dr matthews you presented on the 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 diagnostics and assessments but i don't know if you can answer this question or if it is for um uh, uh dr scott or, or, or dr bowden about um out of those diagnostics and assessments will there be any sort of individualized learning plans um, for for students, or will it be what the class needs versus what the individual needs? Well, teachers will analyze the data to respond to individual student learning needs. There won't be a necessarily like a formal plan written up, but the, the purpose of it is to understand what are those foundational skills from the prior year that, that might, they might do, just need to brush up on, or they might need to um, practice um, before they can learn the next more in-depth skill. Okay, so but it, but it will be so not necessarily a plan, but this child needs a little bit more of this. This child needs a little bit less, mm -hmm. um, and we need to bring them all up. And like our students said earlier, maybe a little bit slowly, but mm -hmm. at some point we're going to bring them up at a, at a at a regular pace. Yes. Okay. And then my second question for. Um, uh, last last question about the parking lot congestion. Um, I don't know if the district staff has um, building staff have noticed more drivers um, because of busing concerns. And if that is a, maybe a possible like that that you know some of those schools have always had parking problems, but now it's worse because yes. of, of of not not wanting kids on buses. That is absolutely correct, and it was it. It's peak in the beginning of the year when uh, very when when it was when the maximum drivers were on the road bringing their students unsure about about the pupil transportation, and that also impacted some of the buses in terms of getting in and out of schools. But it has diminished to some ex extent. But uh, Mr. Gunn and his team have gone out and surveyed it, and we've added some paraeducators and tried to come up with solutions to mitigate it. Um, but yes, it was definitely significantly higher than a typical year. Okay, and and we but but it is it, 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 in some of that we can't control because if a if a parent does want to drive we can't prevent that. Um, do do we ha and we mentioned a bus driver shortage, but we are active. Durham is actively looking and try to get as many buses to get some of those parents the cars off the roads as we can. It, it will still be ultimately the parent cho choice. Parent choice. We, yes. we have <laughs> rerouted and we have increased capacities to where there's. Um, very few buses with three students per seat. So there is capacity to, to transport students, but it's the parent choice yes. that will ultimately make the difference. Yeah, and that is, I mean, it is it, the fact that we can give that choice. So right. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Berth? Um, yep, a couple questions. So um, one was just for um, 
Mr. Beckley, just about the um, number of hotspots and um, broadband connections, if you just had like a rough number of how many we're providing. We have capacity for 1,500 of each. So we haven't received that many requests right mm -hmm. now, but we have 1,500 hotspots available okay. for checkout and 1,500 broadband connections as well. And we, oh, can, so. we can increase. So that we have a total well. of 3,000. 3,000. And that, that's in addition to the ones that are already in use, okay. which number about, uh, about that many. That so we've got 1,500. That's incredible. Yeah. That's great. Th those are ones that were last year. We never, those that needed it last year, we did not collect those Take back. back. So perfect. those okay. are still in use. Okay, perfect. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, my other question, and this is just, I'm not sure how to like put this. So, and maybe it's for Mr. Fleckenstein, um, because we had emailed this week about um, curriculum night. And so, as a parent, my brain's trying to wrap my head around curriculum nights. And so it sounds like they're going to be virtual. So I guess in my head, I thought, and this is, I'm saying this kind of for my community, but also it's a little bit cathartic, right? So I'm thinking my kid's back in school, we're going to have a curriculum night. And so I was thinking that, okay, it won't be in person. And then it's going to be virtual. But now I'm realizing, because I pulled back up the email, I'm like, wait a minute, it's going to be videotaped. So a link's going to be dropped. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is that how is that playing out in the community? Like, how did this come about? Because even as a director, I didn't understand that it's going to be six o'clock tomorrow, a link's going to be dropped, and then I'm assuming I'm going to get seven to 14 videos. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, so each school site um, okay. worked with their staff to determine how they would conduct um, their curriculum nights. One of the challenges that we have, especially with having um, adults on campus, many adults at one any given time, mm -hmm. um, especially in one classroom. Uh, and when we think about how long people would be there, uh, how much time they would be there, and how to manage that many, especially in our large schools, that many bodies in space all at once. There, there was a concern, of course, that we want to keep everybody safe. And so schools had to weigh what sort of modality would they do to get information to families. Some have done or chosen a blended sort of experience where they've had short um, periods of time where people can come on campus staggered. Um, a lot of elementaries, or no, I shouldn't say a lot. Some elementaries have chosen that because it is easier to manage by grade level with individual kids with each teacher. For some of our larger comprehensive schools, like the high schools, um, managing that many bodies all at once, they were concerned about interactions and proximity to people, and so they've chosen to use a virtual option uh, out of safety. So I guess my question, um, and I, it makes complete sense, so I am not, that's totally fine. I think in my brain, I was thinking it'd be more like the IRs where we would actually have like a link because I, I guess what I'm missing is that interaction, right? So we'll see the we'll see the person teaching mm -hmm. and I assume there'll be some video and I've heard the, you know, kind of like, oh, my gosh, I've got to do a video, <laughs> you know, and, and have it done by this date. But I was thinking that we would get like a Zoom link so that as a parent, much like the IRs, we could actually see the teacher and maybe be on Zoom or be in a webinar format. And I. And I guess I'm just asking, I know it's too late, the, you know, um, the horse is out the gate, but, you know, as a parent of a sophomore, for instance, you, potentially that means I'll not actually have a face-to-face -face interaction with my child's teacher until potentially they're a junior. I guess, is that, I mean. Well, I think uh, if I may frame it this yeah. way, um, to get information about the curriculum and academics in each classroom in, mm -hmm. a, in a safe manner, some curriculum nights are virtual. That being said, um, any parent can contact a teacher and request a conference, whether it be safely in person or through a Zoom link or phone call, um, if they want to interact with their teacher in a in a in live. Yeah, time. that's it's, um, okay. Yeah. So I would encourage fam uh, parents if they need to contact a teacher and would like to set up uh, a separate appointment, right, for a more lengthy discussion, that, that they would do they so, do but that. probably outside of our virtual curriculum night. Okay, and I guess my only thought is maybe we could at some point think about because so, that always feels like as a parent that's a little extra right like so I, and i've done that with my kids if they you know hey i'm having a trouble with this class i'll reach out i'll talk to them, but. Um, it'd be great if we could figure out some way to get again just like the IR is super safe zoom some kind of actual interaction because it just feels so distant to where you're not as a parent you've got to go an extra step and even as a teacher if you've got 
30 kids a class, six classes a day, and if all 30 of those parents want to make individual appointments with you, that's going to be mm -hmm. a lot, right? And especially mm -hmm. if it's just to get that energy of the teacher, seeing them, I don't know. So I'm just, I'm putting that out there just because I was like surprised and I'll click on all the links, I guess, and and watch their videos. Um, mm -hmm. But it just feels a little bit impersonal. That's mm -hmm. That was kind of my only thought. So, but thank you for explaining it to me. Thank you for yeah. the feedback. And then my only last kind of question slash comment was, um, Director Mitchell made me think about the plan for families. And I think as we were looking at this, I love everything that all the teachers are doing, I especially love the teachers. Um, you know, the uh, Miss Julie, when you said, you know, you're giving students authentic reasons to write. And and when um, Miss Kaylee was talking about, you know, just that creative community that you're creating. And, and I just love that so, so much. And I feel like over the last couple of years, year and a half, we've asked our parents so much to be partners with us in this, to give our kids authentic reasons to learn, give them community in these different spaces. But maybe as we're doing these assessments and, and seeing gaps and seeing holes, maybe we can partner a little more with parents in that planning piece, because it feels like when, when everything went awry, we really said, hey, parents, you got to team up with us. You have to partner with us. You got to do all this stuff. Now we're kind of back to normal. And it just, I'm just saying this as a parent, it just feels like sometimes there's a disconnect, but if things transition again, we're going to be asked to, to do all that heavy lifting, and maybe we don't have the full plan, we don't have the full understanding. So um, much like Port Gardner has WSLPs, and of course we have our some students on IEPs for different reasons, maybe we can think of that individualized learning as not just a, you know, a side thought or a, an extra thing, but as like every day we need an individualized plan for our kids that they, our parents, our families, our kids know where they are and where they're going. So that's just my two cents. Everybody's doing an amazing job, but as a parent up here, I'm just feeling a little like, I don't want to go home and sit and watch potentially 14 videos, but I will do it. <laughs> so thank you. So just, uh, couple quick questions about the virtual academy um those teachers that were shifted uh were those all voluntary transfers or were they told that hey this is a temporary assignment you're going to be over here what, what was going on there so we follow uh the cba um, with our teachers union which describes how we unassigned staff so part of what we did was we analyzed where we saw enrollment so at each school, we looked at class size, and there were some locations and some classes where there was very little enrollment and we could shift students and still have very moderate to even maybe low class size continue at that school. And at that point, there is a call for volunteers at the school and they volunteer or they ask somebody based on, on uh, where some of those shortfalls came and those staff come forward and they make choices based on all of the openings that are available across the district. So all of those steps are voluntary and they have choices about going back to the school after the school year is over and, and rights to some of those steps. And so, so we feel very fortunate to have the staff that joined us the last few days. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and so where are the, the virtual academy teachers actually teaching from? That's a really good question. They're everywhere. Um, we have eight different sites. They're located throughout the district. So as the summer uh, was going forth and we were planning and building and enrollment was coming in, we worked with each of our principals to identify spaces that were not being used. And that meant that we were already anticipating that some of our enrollment would be lower. And so what you'll see is we have a portable at Gateway, we have a portable at Penny Creek, there's a portable and a room at Heatherwood. And I could go through many different locations, but that's generally how it, it occurred. So they do have support of some kind? Oh, absolutely. They're okay. very supported. Okay. Um, th those are the main things. I really am um, uh, hoping to, to learn more about how it's going in the virtual mm -hmm. academy. And I know it's still early in the process. So looking forward to that, looking forward to the instructional review on December 1st. So um, really, really interested in, in how this is developing. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Matt, point of privilege? Yes. Please. Thank you. First of all, teachers, thank you so much. You represent the teachers so well. And please leave after this so you can go home and rest, OK? You don't have to stay through the whole meeting. Uh, I think to the public and to the board, uh, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. But, but thank you for your support to help us get back um, 
starting the school year in a good start. We always have the little things we got to work on. We admit that. We have to continue working on that. But I wanted to say this publicly. As a coach, you ask your team to go that extra mile, right? We could run one more lap. So I'm just going to ask if the staff can stand up for one minute, just one minute real quick, and thank you. Thank you. the entire team just to get this ready and uh, I know I've asked them to go one more step and we can go two more steps and three more steps and I'm just proud that we reopened but great input today if we can get a little better on the buses we get a little better on open houses we get a little better than we want to do that because our motto is to be better than we were yesterday and that's what we're going to continue doing but to have the youngsters back in school and teachers teaching and to understand what we did those first five days to where we were last year and to where we are now God bless you, teachers. Thank you for everything. And to staff, great job. So thank you. And to the board, thank you for all your support. Thank you for those words. I, um, I couldn't agree more. And I keep hearing about so, so much feedback on, on the social emotional part of it, starting the school year off that way. And I haven't met to date one unhappy parent yet of, or student about being back in school. So um, again, thank you to the teachers for joining us tonight. It is um, tremendously helpful for the board to really understand and see the work that goes on in the classroom. So I appreciate you bringing that here to us tonight. So uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and move on. Thank you. <coughs> We have another item of information and discussion and in following up to our summer workshop where we decided that it would be a great idea to do brief overviews of some of the contracts and programs and items that often fall in our consent agenda on an annual basis. Tonight we have two items that we are going to have short overviews just to dive a little deeper into what those mean and also help our public understand. So. Dr. Bolton is going to take us through our transitional bilingual and early childhood programming. Yes, thank you very much. Good evening, President Mason, Board of Directors, Dr. Salzman. We are very excited to spotlight for you two items that have appeared on our consent agenda annually. And that those are the tri transitional bilingual instructional program and the early childhood, or excuse me, early education assistance program. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome to the podium two members of the academics team, Christopher Fulford, who is the categorical director, as well as Ann Arnold, who is the director of P5 learning and early learning programs. And they're gonna be sharing with you a little bit about each of these programs tonight. Thank you, Dr. Bowden. All right, good evening. Uh, I'm excited at the opportunity to spotlight our transitional bilingual instruction program for short known as TBIP. Uh, this program really serves our kids well and impacts students furthest from educational justice. So I wanna thank the board for their approval of this consent agenda item. So who benefits from these funds? So our TBI grant supports districts in providing direct language acquisition services to multilingual learners and improving to teacher capacity uh, to work with our multilingual students and administration of the program. So we currently serve over 3,000 multilingual learners with this uh, grant and 930 students who have exited from the program that still have access to these supports. Uh, our work with the TBI grant helps us to serve our diverse students and helps us to achieve one of our strategic themes, which is equitable access and re uh, to resources to support student learning. So we use the TBI funds, which is about $5.6 million, uh, to support staffing of our multilingual facilitators, our certificated multilingual teachers, our certificated coaches, our paraeducators and success coordinators for our multilingual students at the high school level. We also provide professional development. We utilize our facilitators at the central office to work with our teachers and our coaches in the buildings along with paraeducators in the development of Project GLAD, which is our guided language and acquisition design and sheltered instruction observation protocol, which we uh, because that's a mouth call, mouthful, call it PSYOP models. So our project GLAD is used at the elementary school level and our PSYOP model is used at the secondary level. We also provide professional development around the WIDA English language and development standards, 
uh, that we continually work to align all of our schools throughout the system to. We use these funds also to support our summer school program for our students receiving multilingual supports. We're also proud uh, that we have launched our first dual language program at Emerson Elementary this school year with our kindergarten cohort. And we are continuing to use funds from this grant to support the task force as we develop this program K-12. We also use this program to purchase the Imagine Language and Literacy online program. This is a targeted adaptive program that helps develop language and literacy skills for our multilingual students. And it also provides um, native language supports in 14 different languages. So our students benefit from these funds uh, through the English language development skills that are provided by their certificated staff and paraeducators, and as long with, or along with the language and literacy program. They're provided access to grade level content standards through the development of the capacity of their general, general education teachers to meet the needs of these multilingual students. And our students who have received our multilingual services in the Everett Public Schools graduate at the same rate as their peers. Thank you again so much uh, for approving this consent agenda item. I'm now going to turn it over to Ann Arnold. Good evening. Thanks so much for an opportunity to share information about our ECAP preschool program. It's one of our most exciting grant programs and one that really has impact on our youngest students and their families. So ECAP stands for Early Childhood Education Assistance Program. It's a free, comprehensive preschool program funded by the Department of Children, Youth, and Families for income-eligible families. That means that the families who apply and get accepted into the ECAP program typically have an income of under $30,000 a year for a family of four. In addition, they have risk factors such as homelessness, foster and kinship care, English learners, household substance abuse, domestic violence, mental health concerns, or developmental concerns or delays. And these risk factors can sometimes offset a slight increase in income so that we are able to evaluate the family and their circumstance in order to be able to serve them in the best way possible. So there are three key components of ECAP. It's not just a preschool program. So they have, we have an education portion, which is half day preschool for 320 three and four year olds at six schools in the district. The schools are Cedarwood, Hawthorne, Jackson, Lowell, Madison, and Silver Lake. Two of those schools, Hawthorne and Silver Lake, have two classrooms. However, we really try to stress across the district and when we communicate with families that this program serves all children in the community who, who um, qualify. So just because it's not at their school and their service area, they're still uh, transported by bus to the program if they, if they qualify. There is a family support component, which includes um, a family support specialist, which conducts home visits. She su offers supports on family goal setting, provides information about accessing community resources, and has ongoing monthly parent education sessions around content that's driven by the parents themselves. So they gather in the evening once a month, they'll have dinner together, and then they will have learning together that's uh, provided by our team, but also but driven by what the parent and families of the program need. Finally, we have a health and nutrition component, which includes regular vision and dental screening, family style meals at school, and food support for families in needs. This was particularly impactful during the um, closure and the virtual programs. We had um, meals picked up at the schools on a regular basis for all of our families. And then when they couldn't come to the school, our family support specialists did porch drop off of not only meals, but activities and materials, resources that they could use. This is a program that really supports our priority student outcomes. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons it's so exciting. So our first three student outcomes of ensuring third grade literacy, increasing science achievement, and increasing math achievement are all directly impacted by this early learning opportunity. Our longitudinal data in the district shows us that the students who take WAC kids, the assessment that Dr. Matthews referenced, and are at benchmark in the six developmental areas when they come into kindergarten are far more likely, there's a very, very direct correlation between them passing the SBA at, at their grade level in reading and math in third grade. And conversely, our students who come into kindergarten and aren't at benchmark in those six developmental areas, unfortunately, very often do not meet benchmark in third grade in reading and math. 
This is a huge argument, in my opinion, for supporting our youngest learners and getting them on that trajectory of success, really changing what their life outcome can be, because we know that very early on, those things are really set. And um, we have an opportunity to make a huge difference there. In addition, um, excuse me, this is a program that really reduces gaps in achievement among student groups. The data I just shared with you about the correlation there is true across all student groups. It's not just some, it's all of our kids. So if we can get them on that trajectory, get them to come into kindergarten with the skills and experiences they need for success, we have a very good opportunity to ensure their success moving forward. It also has a huge piece um, that contributes to strengthening student wellness, engagement, and safety with that family support component. So we work really around uh, helping families create stability in their, in their homes. We help them find education opportunities. We do everything under the sun through our family support specialist to give them the resources they need to continue to grow and develop as a family. So thank you very much for supporting ECAP Preschool and for helping our youngest learners be successful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the overview. Um, I am really enjoying these um, little highlights of our, <laughs> our items just because um, you can, like I said, I think before, you can read a contract, you know, from beginning to end, and you just don't understand the whole program and the nuances. I have to say also, they're, um, they take up their fair share of acronyms on this, these two. <laughs> there are a whole lot there. <laughs> um, directors, do you have any questions or comments? Or either of the presenters or Dr. Bode? So on um, on the ECAP program, we're currently at 320 kids for this. Do we have a, a cap? Like are we, do we have a maximum number of students we can currently serve or children that we can currently serve? The state funds us for a certain number of slots. It is mm -hmm. a per student cost, and it is at 320 right now for half day programs. We have an opportunity and have expanded in the past. Quite honestly, the income eligibility requirement has uh, makes it a push to fill all of those slots and find those families. Not that they're not out there, mm -hmm. but finding them is sometimes somewhat difficult. But we're capped right now at 320. Do we have a wait list of? of we don't right okay. now. In oh. fact, we are sending banners out to every single school in the district, announcing that free preschool is available, and um, trying to encourage um, applications and enrollment. Great. That's great to know. Thank you. Can I ask for that that thirty thousand dollar limit for a family? That seems ridiculously low, like extreme poverty yes. versus poverty, which is what forty five thousand or yes. so. And when was the last time that was adjusted, or is it adjusted? Because I mean, that just seems like like you said, it's hard to find people it is out a huge there versus barrier. our kids of poverty that would really benefit from a program like this. It is an issue and it's a it's a huge barrier. It's one of the reasons that we work really hard to identify families who have these additional risk factors um, so that we can balance out that income. So is that an issue. or? Pardon me? Is it an or risk factors or is it an is it thirty thousand or a risk factor? No, it's an and. It's an and so the income can go up slightly as the risk factors go up. Okay. But it's still it's a real struggle. In fact, it's a in my opinion, one of the flaws of the system, yeah. because um, that income requirement is the same in Everett, Washington, as it is in Yakima, in which as it Kansas. is in Battle <laughs> Creek. I yeah. mean, battleground everywhere. It's yeah. there's no different. Yeah, and and mm. and so it is, and it's it's you know it's not even our state state poverty. It, it you know free and reduced lunch is at a higher rate than that. So it, it's our. It, <laughs> Thank you for confirming my <laughs> why you can't find so many students. And you know, I do know they limit it for funding, but it, it's a it's also a disservice to a lot of kids. It's one of the reasons that we launched transitional kindergarten two years ago. Yes, and that was because um, we don't have that income eligibility element there, and we literally go to um, our lists of families who applied for ECAP and didn't get in and we recruit them for transitional kindergarten because we don't aren't limited with transitional kindergarten by any income yeah and, and well and it's it's why the foundation supported all day kindergarten for students of need at, at free and reduced lunch needs not at thirty thousand dollar needs before we had all day kindergarten right because right. those kids of poverty need the most support of you know all kids need the education but you know education gets kids out of poverty so thank you so much <coughs>
Um, I, oh, sorry. I just have two questions. I know I didn't want you to have to go all the way back. <laughs> sorry. Um, so one question, just to clarify. So our foster families, kids in the foster care program, those are automatically qualified. Is that my understanding or my, do I have they, that That's one of the highest risk, risk factors and they get moved very quickly very up to the top of the list. I mean, if they were a family with a very high income, they might not get in, but it is usually something that happens fairly quickly. I just talked to a family at Jackson. I, I was going to ask if there, so are, so have we turned down any foster families because of income ineligibility? I don't know the answer to that specifically, but okay. I'm not aware of any. Okay, because that, okay, that's awesome. Um, the other question is, do we do early ECAP in our district? We do not. And do, is there a reason, like, is it because we don't have the capacity or is it because we just don't have the need or? I mean, there's only so many slots, I get that part, but I think they, we doubled them this year, so. We have talked about it quite a bit, actually, because we think there's an opportunity there. One of the challenges we have is space mm -hmm. and um so we have to balance those okay. two things off and trying to figure out how that makes the most sense um, we we are a little bit hesitant to um move forward with ecap because of this income eligibility issue we are having a hard time serving the families that we think we need to our working poor families do not qualify for ecap yeah, yeah. and no, you can no. have two members of the family uh, making minimum wage and they won't qualify yep no and i was just wondering because with the early ecap it might be an early entry point so sometimes mm -hmm. families that could qualify with those younger kiddos they um anyway and that puts them in the good positioning for our transitional k so okay perfect thank, thank you, you. Any further questions? Okay, well, I'd thank like you. to thank you three for a great presentation. Go ahead and move forward. And our next two items of business are 14.0 new business, or 13.0 unfinished business and 14.0 new business. And we do not have either tonight. So we will go ahead and take a look at our upcoming agenda items. Dr. Salzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors and the public. At our October 12th meeting, we will discuss the following. Several policies for first reading, enrollment update, Gertrude Jackson roster, and the OSPI equity dual credit grant. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Our next item is 16.0, and that's executive or closed session. And tonight we do have a closed session uh, immediately following the board meeting, the board will hold a closed session in the Silver Lake room to receive a collective bargaining update. The anticipated length of the closed session is 10 minutes. No action will be taken during the closed session. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and adjourn this meeting and thank everyone for being here tonight to support our work. This meeting is adjourned.